Screeched in love. Rain sluiced off the windshield wipers. From her seat on the bus, Elsa could barely see the trees bordering the road. It was day 12 of her two-week bus tour of Newfoundland, and she had lost her heart to the beauty and irreverent culture of the island. Her eyes focused on John's back, wondering how difficult it was to drive a bus in such conditions. As an older single woman, on a tour populated mostly by retired couples, Elsa often sat with John at meals. His open-hearted manner and penetrating interpretation of his island's history had added a totally unexpected layer of enchantment to her trip. Their long conversations and easy silences filled an emptiness she had too long ignored. Once parked at the restaurant where they were to eat dinner, John hopped outside in the pouring rain to assist passengers. He reached for Elsa's hand, his fingers closing around hers, perhaps a bit longer than necessary. He was so different from her ex-husband of 30 years. When she left him four years previously, she had put marriage in the rearview mirror. She never thought this trip would be anything more than a scenic break from everyday life. And now these extraordinary feelings for a man she barely knew. She reveled in his touch and hungered to know if his kindness was meant especially for her. In him, she saw the allure of Newfoundland made human. After dinner, mindful that there were just two days remaining, Elsa dropped her things in her hotel room and went in search of John. She was determined to tell him how she felt. She found him in the bar. Her heart pounded in her chest as she slid onto the stool next to him, savoring the sexual charge that ran through her as their legs touched. I was hoping I'd find you, she whispered into his ear. John, Elsa, what a nice surprise. A couple from the tour took up residency on the other two bar stools. Since staff fraternization with passengers was forbidden, John and Elsa quickly pulled apart. Elsa's heart sank. And then John placed his hand on her thigh. Barely able to breathe, she managed, Oh, hi. I was just ordering Screech on the Rocks. One screech led to another. John, always gracious, made the conversation flow easily. Finally, he said, I've got to get to bed. Me too. Elsa rose with John. At her door, Elsa took out her key, but she couldn't bring herself to end the evening. She turned to look at John. His blue eyes captured hers. He smiled. I don't want this evening to end. Will you take a walk with me? Not trusting her ability to speak, Elsa simply nodded. The rain had stopped. The evening was breezy and comfortably cool. About halfway down the hotel driveway, where a tree shielded them from the hotel, John drew Elsa into his arms. His kiss tasted deliciously like cigarette smoke. Her heart exploded. Getting Hitched The woman wearing a well-worn smock was piling still warm and peachy pink curls on top of the bride's head. She grimaced while carefully securing her nervous client's curls with bobby pins. You know, dear, said the stylist as she made cracking sounds with her gum, irritating the older patron in the adjacent salon chair. I was married once. It changes you, but like it or not, you'll grow from it. So try to relax and enjoy your special day, sweetie. She then took a swig of cold coffee from the styrofoam cup she had filled up an hour earlier. Did you get divorced? The young woman asked after the hairstylist fastened the final shiny locks in place and gave her an appraising look. She replied with a chuckle. That ain't no question to be asking on your wedding day. Looking proudly at the golden halo of rosy curls before her, she then added, and voila, look how beautiful you are, as she whipped the tattered black cape away from her latest masterpiece. The bride-to-be looked at her perfectly made-up face and coiffed hair, and they seemed contrived and even silly next to the striped flannel shirt she was wearing. She smiled and said, It looks great. Thank you. She continued to stare at her reflection as salon guests and staff
staff oohed and awed like a well-trained choir. But instead of modestly or proudly glowing, an invisible cataract fell over her eyes, drawing her inward. She started thinking of decapitating Barbie dolls and switching their heads to different doll bodies when she was a little girl. She thought, that's exactly how I look now. Her head was somehow on the wrong body. She recalled that her child self would eventually put the doll's head back on its rightful counterpart. She was never really sure what prompted her to perform this reverse swap, but she always did. As her contemplation concluded, she pulled away from her gaze, wondering if it was truly her own. She then offered polite thank yous to her hemmed in audience and headed to the front of the counter to pay for her transformation. She sheepishly exited the salon as the onlookers returned to their own conversations and as she approached her car, she was surprised to find her partner waiting inside with a warm smile and a mischievous glint in her eyes. She was already wearing her wedding dress and wore a long, simple braid to one side of her head with a daisy jutting out from the other side carelessly tucked behind her ear. Get in here and let's go get married, beautiful, the flower donning woman said in her typical easy manner. In that moment, the bride-to-be felt her pasted smile morph into a genuine grin. She got into the car and noticed, getting hitched, was scrawled backwards in pink on the rear window. She laughed out loud as she closed the door, her tone unbridled, completely forgetting that she had the wrong head on her body. Did I ever tell you about the time I met William Fury, the Montreal poet in the plateau? At Bistro Duluth, I sat at the bar with my Belgian beer. He sat next to me, perhaps looking to get laid, but I didn't notice. He asked me what I did in my spare time. I said rather cockily that I write poetry, not knowing his name, not knowing his trade. Oh, so do I, he responded, and suggested we both get some of what we had written and meet back in 10 minutes. Living around the first corner and here around the other, I happily obliged, returning with my crumpled up pages and he with two hardcover books. He read from my rumples, generously encouraging my craft. I, embarrassed, read through night letters and 12 poems as I lost the buzz from my beer. And there we were, published poet and poetaster. Later we walked around La Main and knocked on Leonard Cohen's door at Pac du Portugal, but he was not home. It took me 30 years before I wrote another poem. But where did Bill go all this time? I searched for his new poems in books, of course. I searched for his new poems to sop up, to taste, to swallow, to love from a blushed distance. But I found none. Lost Lands, A Work in Progress by Karen Murray Bergquist. On the deck of a ship, a storm is brewing. Fortunately, so is tea. Enter Karis, who brings a cup of it to Branwen at the helm. Branwen, that's good on the hands. Karis, any sign? Branwen, of what? Karis, life. Branwen, only yourself, love. Karis, at night it almost feels like we're alone in the world. Branwen, don't worry about that. We'll make port, you and I. A kiss. That is what should happen next. I just don't know how to start it. Who leans in? Why now? Perhaps Branwen initiates it for comfort. 
perhaps Keris to show that she isn't as gloomy as she sounds. How would two vagabonds express love in legendary medieval Wales? Keris, still no sign of land. Branwen, we're just a little off course. Keris, we should have stolen a navigator with the ship. They should explain what they're doing here, but they won't. They're both remembering the hall where they served a corrupt lord, the magical sinking thereof. They'll avoid the subject as much as they can. The wind is fierce, and Karis pulls her cloak tighter. Branwen does not. Karis, there's music in that. Branwen, not half so good on the ears as yours. Karis, you're distracting me, aren't you? Branwen, what makes you think that? Karis, the fact that every time I bring up our surroundings, you talk about something else. Branwen, well, maybe I don't want to talk about the wind and the rain. Maybe I'd rather talk about music. Karis, do you doubt we'll make it through? Of course she doubts. They're at sea. The sea is made of doubt. A kiss is what should happen here for desperate reassurance. For warmth, too. Even with the knocking of the ship, the motion of the waves all but throwing them at each other, I can't make them kiss until they need to. Branwen, get some sleep. The night ocean is no place for a musician. Freeze your fingers off. Karis, why don't you tell me what's on your mind? Branwen, I do. Karis, what are you thinking now? Bremen. How good this tea is. This is a lie. She's finding it difficult to balance the mug and steering the ship. Karis, let me take that. Bremen. Sure. Karis, I mean the helm. Let me take that while you have tea. Bremen. Oh, thanks. Here, don't steer so close to the wind. Turn it slightly. Karis. Ah, mind the tea. Bremen. Wait a moment. What's that? Karis. A light. Bremen. That's either the nearest harbour or a sunken star. Karis, out here, I believe either. Bremen, should we follow it? Karis, I'll follow it to the ends of the earth on one condition. Bremen, what condition? Karis, tell me what you're thinking. Bremen, how glad I am that we ran away to sea together. Karis, after there was nowhere else to go? Bremen, after there was nothing stopping us. Finally, a kiss is what happens here. You shield the bundle beneath your jacket. The wind cuts through the thin layer of polyester like it's paper. You're not dressed for the pernicious bluster of a winter storm, but that's what happens when you do not accurately account for the vagaries of the weather while choosing your outfit. The bundle underneath your jacket is the one source of warmth for your chilled body. You absorb it into your breast. A mother's ecstasy felt for just a moment. Gingerly, you make your way to your car. Ever so gently, you transfer the warmth nestled in your jacket to the passenger seat. You turn on the car, crank the heat, and reluctantly enter the unpredictable currents of city traffic. You feel a vibration. After a few careless moments of fumbling with numb fingers, you manage to bring the phone to your ear. Hello? Oh, thank God! Why aren't you home yet? I thought something happened. No need to worry. I just took a little detour. In this weather? Why? To get you something. Really? What? You smile. The way she said really, quick and high-pitched, made the extra effort all worth it. What is it that you always crave during the first snow of the year, you ask? Your body? Your smile grows. Besides that. A moment's pause, then an excited gasp. Poutine! <laughs> yep. I got the fries, and they're dressed for a party. I am always ready to party. I'll be waiting. Love you. Love you, too.